Turok Dinosaur Hunter isn't often considered a landmark shooter like Doom or Wolfenstein, but it probably should be. Released during the Nintendo 64's launch window, Turok helped set the standard for console shooters. And more importantly, it moved the action from the Windows screensaver mazes of previous games and threw players into the middle of a dark and primordial jungle. Playing as Tal Sat, aka Turok, aka the Son of Stone, you battle your way through the Lost Land, a place where past, present, and future meet. It's a bit like the Land of the Lost television series, but with significantly more blood and violence, which is also why it's significantly cooler. The game's story is pretty simple. You'll learn virtually nothing while you're actually playing, but the instruction manual gives a bit more background. And by that, I mean a single paragraph. This dude named the campaigner is trying to collect the pieces of a weapon called the Chronoceptor for evil purposes. Turok's strength is not in its narrative, which makes the fact that it's based on a long-running comic series all the more confounding. The character of Turok was first introduced to the world in the 50s, but in this early incarnation, the setting was an isolated valley where dinosaurs survived the extinction event, closer in tone to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World. The games, however, are based on a newer series published by Valiant, and this is where things got really weird and extremely 90s. Anyway, since I'm not really a comics reader, like, at all, there's no point in giving an extended history lesson. It's all just window dressing anyway. What really matters here is the gameplay. As a Nintendo fan growing up, I had dabbled with Doom a bit, but Turok was my real introduction to the first-person shooter genre. And it totally kicked my butt. The original release for the Nintendo 64 is hard with a capital H, and not always for the right reasons. Maybe you're into that, or you're a purist and you like to play games in their earliest incarnations. That's fine, but for most of us living in 2023, the recent remaster by Night Dive Studios is the way to go. They always seem to know which rough edges should be sanded away and what should be left alone to retain that retro charm. By playing the remaster, you'll have smoother controls, slightly polished visuals, and you'll actually be able to see where the hell you're going. Yes, the distance fog necessitated by the Nintendo 64's hardware has been significantly reduced. Now, when you say it adds to the atmosphere, you're telling the truth and not just trying to delude yourself. As a kid, this was my biggest gripe, so I'm glad I can finally play the game the way it was probably meant to be experienced. Without the fog, Turok's sprawling environments seem much less confusing to navigate. And being able to see how sheer cliffs and various pathways connect to one another enhances my appreciation of the great level design. When the game starts, you're given instructions to locate a place called the Hub Ruins. And from there, it's off to the races. No cutscenes, no tutorial, just charge ahead and start killing. I love the simplicity of this intro. The game does an excellent job of quickly explaining the basics without the need for text or dialogue. You cross a bridge and immediately find a wall that can be climbed, and then a key, and then a switch, and finally a gun with ammo and a deer to shoot. It's all very elegant and teaches you what to look for and how to navigate without drawing attention to itself. Within minutes, you'll be gunning down mercenaries, raptors, and ape-like purlins, navigating winding canyons, ruins, and exploring dangerous caves. As the level progresses, you'll probably find more keys, maybe even all of them, as well as a piece of the Chronoceptor. The keys are used to open portals to later missions in the hub ruins, and the Chronoceptor pieces, as you might guess, are used to construct the ultimate weapon. This makes the final boss a breeze, but it's not required to complete the game. The keys, on the other hand, are all mandatory, which I'm a bit torn on. Honestly, a lot of older first-person titles seem to have the same obsession with keys and locked doors, so it's not exactly surprising that Turok leans so heavily in this direction. And if you're into exploration, it's fine. I just wish the game could have been a bit more lenient maybe employing a system closer to Super Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie, where keys are generic and can be used to open any level. And it's not like finding them is some impossible task. 
They're generally pretty obvious, and there's an Etch-A-Sketch map to help you focus on unexplored areas. It just hurts the momentum a bit, encouraging you to double back and check every branching path, instead of just blasting forward. Luckily, this is mostly a first playthrough kind of problem. Once you've beaten the game and learn all the key locations, this minor annoyance stops mattering altogether. Turok is also very old school in its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Your base movement speed is incredibly fast and you never need to slow down to reload or wait for a shield to recharge. This is one of those games where you can hold every weapon and where health packs are king. Although for players used to more modern experiences, you might find this particular system a little odd. Once you reach 100 HP, you won't be able to collect larger pickups that grant 25 or 100 points, but you can still keep stacking the small 2 unit points to a maximum of 250. This is a neat idea since it prevents you from being too strong at any one time, but once you get good at the game, it leads to the unfortunate situation where you don't really care about what should be more desirable pickups. If I'm over 100, I could care less about 20 points, but man, give me more of those twos. In fact, the various bonus rooms generally offer larger health items as a reward, and more often than not, I walk right through them. In addition to your base health, there's also tech armor, which adds an extra layer of protection. And on top of it all, you also run the risk of running out of lives and getting a game over. And trust me, this can cost you a lot of progress. Considering the frankly absurd amount of platforming this game has, and the fact that falling into an abyss is insta-death, you better grab as many life force tokens as you can get your grubby little polygonal hands on. I mean, just take a look. This would be tough for Mario, let alone Turok. Thankfully, the remaster has full analog control, which helps a lot and almost makes jumping feel like second nature. You can still make mistakes if you're not careful, but it's a far cry from moving around with the C buttons on the Nintendo 64. One of the best things about Turok is its variety, especially in terms of environments. It's true, you'll see a lot of the same jungles and caves, but there are also ruins, a treetop village that looks like something out of Return of the Jedi, lava pits, alien-looking industrial areas, and the dreaded catacombs. This is probably the only level I don't love. It's very maze-like, with secret passages, traps, and more branching paths than the human brain can reasonably keep track of. It's not torturous, and you can definitely learn the best way through, but on your first run, it's almost guaranteed to overwhelm. As for the coolest level in the game, it's probably the final confrontation. At this point, you're fully decked out and there aren't any items left to hunt down. All that matters is navigating through the labyrinth of futuristic tunnels and blowing away everything that crosses your path. The enemies you'll face are also quite varied. There are the prerequisite velociraptors and mercenaries, but also hostile natives, aliens, bugs, crabs, graboids, demons, robots, and of course, robot dinosaurs. New enemies are introduced at a steady pace and they're often broken into their own subgroups. The hostile natives, for example, might attack up close with spears, stand back with blowguns, or maybe even cast voodoo spells. Wait, is this racist? I, I don't know. It, it was 1997. It was a different time. I love the way enemies express themselves through movement, and shooting them always feels satisfying, with one exception. The mercenaries have multiple death animations, which is never a bad thing, but the one where they stagger around with their throats spurting blood doesn't make a ton of sense. It looks great if you take them down with a bow or a knife, but not so much if you just blasted them with an explosive shell. And that brings me to the next topic, guns. A first person shooter is only as good as its arsenal, and boy does Turok deliver. There are primitive weapons like the knife and bow I just mentioned, more contemporary options like shotguns and assault rifles, and then tons of fun futuristic stuff. Pulse rifles, rocket launchers, fusion cannons, it's all here. Some personal favorites of mine are the assault rifle with its satisfying rat -ta, -ta, ta the automatic shotgun which allows you to hold down the trigger for a frankly dirty rate of fire, 
And of course, the tech arrows, which combine the best of old and new weaponry. They're arrows that explode into big blue clouds of plasma. What's not to like? And if this sounds like overkill, don't forget about the bosses. There's only four, but they're all winners. First, you fight a jeep. No, wait, make that two jeeps. Or maybe I spoke too soon because it's actually two jeeps and a man. After that, there's a giant praying mantis that kicks down walls and spits acid. And of course, one of the coolest bosses in all of gaming, the cybernetic Tyrannosaurus Rex. At first, it seems like a regular dinosaur, but as the fight rages on, its skin peels away to reveal a metallic endoskeleton. It's like the Terminator, but it's a dinosaur. Oh, and it breathes fire. Through and through, Turok exudes a constant sense of badassery. A lot of that is achieved through the fast-paced run-and-gun gameplay, but it's helped along by a stellar soundtrack. Everything is very tribal with a constant pulsating rhythm. It's awesome. And sometimes they take it to the next level. Just have a listen. This is what you hear when you're exploring the ancient city. Right? Isn't that great? And oftentimes the music also blends into sound design with distant dinosaur calls and other ambient sounds of nature. And finally, it's worth mentioning the graphics. The game is old and the remaster is pretty light in this regard. So you're still looking at blocky Nintendo 64 era character models. That said, there's a definite charm to the art style. And the fluid animations, as I mentioned, really help to sell the visuals. Turok isn't going to wow anyone today, but back when it came out, it was a real showcase for what the Nintendo 64 could do. In case you haven't guessed, Turok Dinosaur Hunter gets my highest possible recommendation. The remastered version by Night Dive is available on most modern platforms and goes a long way to making the game more accessible. So if you haven't played since the original release or you have never tried it, I recommend setting aside a little Turok time. After the release of Turok Dinosaur Hunter on the Nintendo 64, a sequel was inevitable. And just two years later, Acclaim produced Turok 2 Seeds of Evil. This was an ambitious title, and while it may have been overshadowed by The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time released one month earlier, it remains an impressive game, despite a few flaws. As was the case with our previous video, we'll be playing Night Dive's Remaster, as opposed to the original cartridge. Moving with the C buttons and aiming with an inverted stick once seemed perfectly acceptable to me, but now it's almost impossible to go back. Just look at this footage I captured. Turok is moving around like a drunken sailor. Hey you, stay stealth side and show ya. Anyway, aside from controls, this version has a lot of the same strengths as Night Dive's remaster of Turok Dinosaur Hunter. The only other things to mention are the original version's choppy frame rate, which has been replaced with silky smooth animation here, and the addition of waypoint markers to help with some of the game's more cryptic sections. When comparing the two games, I think Turok 2 is definitely a massive step forward from a presentation standpoint. But in terms of gameplay, it's more of a sidestep. Whether you enjoy this one over the original really comes down to personal preference. As I said, I think it's a pretty great game, and the things I complain about, especially in terms of the remaster, might not bother you at all. Right off the bat, Turok 2 separates itself from the original by opening with a cutscene and actually bothering to establish a plot. 
Joshua Fireseed, the newest hero to take on the mantle of Turok, finds himself in the company of Adon, the Speaker of Forever Light. She explains in a muffled British accent the critical need to defeat an ancient alien known as the Primogen. There's a lot of interesting lore to go along with this, dealing with the creation of the Lost Land and an even greater threat lurking in the shadows, but it really just serves to give a bit of context to the environments and enemies. The story develops in fits and spurts as you go, while mostly remaining separate from the main action. And hey, with gameplay this good, that's fine by me. Variety remains Turok's biggest strength. Along your journey, you'll face off against dinosaurs, both humanoid and not, the ape-like purlins, a hive of intelligent insects, creepy blind trolls, courtesy of Twitter, and of course, the undead can't do without those. The animations are even better than the original game. The dinosaurs in particular convey a lot of character in their movements, both as they traverse the environment and react to damage. In Turok 2 you can blow off limbs, stick them with arrows which you can collect from their dead bodies, and unlike the first game, enemies go down faster if you aim for their head. A green dinosaur, for instance, can take clip after clip in the arms, the one shot to the face, and he's down. And the gratuitous gore never fails to add a satisfying spray or splurt to drive home the fact that Turok is a ruthless and efficient killer. Seriously, you feel like a real badass tearing through these guys. And since they're keeping lost children hostage and poisoning a major city's water supply, you can rest easy knowing that's all justified. As for Turok's tools of destruction, the arsenal in this game is absolutely legendary. There's the quad rocket launcher, the firestorm cannon, the pulse rifle, the shredder, and even a throwable saw blade. And again, thanks to the extremely graphic violence, even less exciting weapons like the pistol and shotgun are a ton of fun to use. And while its reputation may precede it, it would be a crime to talk about Turok 2's weapons and not mention the Cerebral Bore. If there's anything anyone remembers from this game, this is it. Often considered one of the best guns in any first person shooter, the Cerebral Bore does exactly what you think. It shoots a homing projectile that seeks out enemies and drills into their head, dispatching them in the most brutal way possible. Remember, they're bad guys and they deserve this. Probably. Also, just like in the first game, there's a super weapon to construct. This time it's the nuke, which seems a little bland compared to the Chrono Scepter, and doesn't make as much of a splash when you finally use it against the last boss. Maybe because, unlike its predecessor, it's not an instant win button. Anyway, I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about collectibles and exploration. Turok 2 features just six levels, and only one of them is as confusing as the first game's catacomb stage. But levels 4 and 5 are far, far worse. The Lair of the Blind Ones and the Hive of the Mantids are two of the most sprawling and frustrating stages I have ever played. They're riddled with portals, branching paths, tricky platforming, and crisscrossing, overlapping tunnels many of which look almost identical. And these places are both absolutely ginormous in scope. Honestly, I'll never understand gamers' obsession with bigger and bigger worlds. After a while, you start to reach a point of diminishing returns, trading economic and effective level design for, for, well, the layer of the blind ones. What makes matters worse is that the game doesn't only maintain Turok, Dinosaur Hunter's key and weapon piece hunt, it doubles down on these ideas by introducing sub-objectives in each stage, such as activating distress beacons, defeating witches, or defending energy totems. If you reach an end portal without completing all of these tasks, which is almost certainly going to happen, you're sent right back to the beginning. And if that wasn't enough, there's even a light Metroid element that involves collectible feathers that grant new abilities. So, while you're playing through a level, you might notice a jump you can't make or poison water you can't swim in. These are places you have to commit to memory and return to when you acquire the appropriate ability. Again, 
I don't mind hidden secrets and rewarding exploration, but aside from the nuke pieces, every single feather, objective, and ability is 100% necessary to complete the game. So maybe now you understand what I was talking about earlier. If you like a good scavenger hunt and don't mind maze-like environments, these complaints might seem like strengths. If I'm being truthful, the levels are still very well designed from an objective standpoint. I just think the emphasis on collectibles really conflicts with the more action-oriented shooting aspect. I said the same thing about the first game, but it's annoying that you can never just run and gun without stopping to check the map or doubling back to investigate the other three branching paths you didn't take. There's definitely a sense of accomplishment gleamed from filling out your inventory and slowly opening up more of the hub area, but personally, I think the developers went a bit too far. To help illustrate my point, just take a look at this section early in the second level. Here you hop aboard a Styracosaurus armed with rocket launchers and take out turrets and barricades while grunts flee in terror. This set piece is so fun that it's a shame the game doesn't dabble with this kind of thing more often. The only other times it reaches the same highs are against the various boss enemies, which match the standard set by the first game and sometimes even exceed it. The boss of the Primogen's lightship, simply called the Mother, is especially cool. I like the realistic look of her skin, and as you blow off her limbs, she grows new ones, drastically changing her style of attack in the process. This is pretty ambitious given when the game was made. In fact, it's still pretty impressive today. In terms of music, Turok 2 is another winner. I don't know if the tracks are as instantly memorable as the first game, but they're definitely great while you're playing, adding a sense of urgency to the proceedings, even if you're just wandering in circles looking for a key. My favorite track is probably the one that plays when you're in these factory areas fighting the Flesh Eaters. It's very cool. In general, the focus of the music has switched a little. It's less bombastic and generally creates more of a haunting atmosphere, which is something this game excels at. Each of the environments is very distinct and some are downright jaw-dropping. The first level, in particular, has a lot of really pretty locations. It combines minimalist, almost Roman architecture with waterways, wooden ships, and massive ornate statues. Overall, I think I still prefer the first Turok game, but I can understand completely why someone might think the second is better. It is an obvious improvement in many ways. I'm just not big on the decision to double down on collectibles and mazes. Certain levels are designed in such a way that almost seems malicious, which might not make for a fun experience. Anyway, take that as you will, and even if you're like me and you don't particularly like scavenger hunts in your first person shooters, I'd give it a go anyway, if for no other reason than to try the cerebral bore. Trust me, it'll blow your mind. Like, like, literally. <laughs> hey, over here! Hey, over here! I'm free! Thank you! I'm free! Thank you! As you might have guessed, I'm a pretty big Turok fan. And, if you can believe it, I've never played Turok 3 Shadow of Oblivion. Sure, I've owned the cartridge for the better part of a decade, but as any game hoarder will tell you, that doesn't mean squat. Honestly, after getting my hands on Night Dive's excellent remasters of the first two games, I was kind of hoping I could just hold out for part 3 to get the same treatment. And if you saw my pathetic Nintendo 64 gameplay from the previous videos, you can probably imagine why. Certain retro games are timeless, and others are, let's just say, hard to go back to. Thankfully, Turok 3, Shadow of Oblivion, falls somewhere in between. Right off the bat, 
I have to say, this game is weird. It really feels like the people behind it weren't really interested in making Turok. It's often been compared to Half-Life, which is probably accurate, but truth be told, that's another one on my bucket list, so I'll just have to take their word on that. If I were to draw my own comparisons, Turok 3 has shades of Goldeneye and Perfect Dark due to the general look of the environments, and the way auto-aim compensates for the Nintendo 64 sometimes iffy analog control. But also, certain parts, especially those with zombies wandering through abandoned streets, really brought to mind Resident Evil 2. By all accounts, these are all good games and totally worth ripping off, but it's a bit of a shame that Turok 3 doesn't actually start feeling like Turok at all until the game is almost half over. It's at this point that you leave behind the city streets and secret labs and return to the primordial jungles of the Lost Land. In fact, you literally go through the first area from the original Turok. That was a nice touch. And really, once you've completed the entire game, the whole it doesn't feel like Turok thing loses a bit of weight. Sure, the developers took a few big swings, but in the end they deliver enough jungles, ruins, and prehistoric monsters to whet your appetite for the series' signature style. And actually experiencing the devastation occurring in the real world adds extra urgency to your eventual trip to the Lost Land. In previous Turok games, yeah, sure, we knew the campaigner and the primogen intended to cause similar harm, but it always seemed like a threat rather than an active problem. Turok 3 opens with the hero of the previous game, Joshua Fireseed, haunted by visions. He dreams of a young boy being tormented by the Flesh Eaters, which, if you recall, were an army of demon things under the control of the previously unseen force known only as Oblivion. A Lovecraftian terror from before time who seeks to destroy the Turok lineage once and for all. His first big move here is to straight up murder Joshua, which kinda sucks to be honest. It's weird that you played as him for a whole game taking out monsters like a pro, and the second you lose control he gets shot up by a bunch of thugs. Oh well, it doesn't matter anyway because there are two more fire seeds waiting to take the mantle. Danielle and Joseph. This is where Adon comes in, also returning from Turok 2, albeit horribly redesigned to service fans she may or may not have. Adon essentially asks the remaining fire seeds to decide who will accept the light burden and take the mantle of Turok. And really, she's asking you, the player. I picked Danielle because something about this shrunken adult male who's supposed to be 14 freaked me out. But for the sake of this review, I did dabble with Joseph a bit after completing the game, and it seems like the differences between the characters aren't too stark. The main quest is the same, but each fire seed has unique abilities that sometimes determine which branching path they'll take. Danielle can jump higher and wields a grappling hook, while Joseph can crawl through small spaces and use night vision goggles in the dark. I guess this is another way in which the game somewhat emulates Resident Evil 2. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. In previous videos, I mentioned how I wasn't big on the scavenger hunt aspect of the first two Turok games, and mostly just tolerated it because I loved, well, everything else. Turok 3 is the first title in the series to dump this design philosophy altogether. The campaign is broken up into a series of linear sections, and players are given infinite lives as well as frequent checkpoints. Sometimes the areas will double back on themselves, demonstrating a degree of interconnectivity, and often you'll need to achieve non-linear objectives to move on. But this style of level design is much closer to modern first-person shooters. Most of your goals are clear and easy to achieve, and the puzzles rarely require anything more complex than just shooting something. Along the way, you'll still find life force tokens, but instead of granting a bonus Turok, collecting 100 will expand your maximum health. This is a great change, since it really motivated me to go out of my way or take dangerous routes to collect as many as I could. As for the content of the levels, I quite like what this game has to offer. You're always doing something new, whether it's blasting monsters off of a subway train, rising on vents of air in an active volcano, or passing through a series of well-fortified checkpoints along a river. 
The environments are equally varied, with some truly outstanding locations that are only sometimes marred by the consistently drab graphics. I think it's safe to say that, in terms of aesthetics, this is a pretty big step down from Turok 2. For the purposes of this review, I've been using emulators to capture footage from the Nintendo 64 titles. And as I mentioned, I ran into a lot of trouble with Turok 1 and 2, particularly the movement. You see, the Nintendo 64 has only one analog stick, so developers needed to rely on the C buttons to maneuver the character. This is similar to how shooters feel with mouse and keyboard controls, but in previous titles, walking felt stiff and tank-like. Thankfully, it's much smoother here. And, like I said, the auto-aim feature is a nice improvement as well. It's totally optional, but unless this game gets a modern update, I think it compensates nicely for any analog-related clunkiness. Overall, I really got into Turok 3's controls, and on a base level, they're probably the best of the original trilogy. That said, a lot of other issues muddy what should otherwise be a clear upgrade. For starters, the movement speed is turned way down, which sucks. One of the most refreshing things about the original Turok in particular is just how jacked up he is, bolting full tilt through jungles like a race car with guns. It's a ton of fun, and even if you're just going in circles looking for keys, it was never a slog. In this game, it feels like you have the crouch button toggled on and can't turn it off. It's pretty awful. And then there's the game's overall lack of polish. The enemies are a lot less lively in terms of animation, and the gore effects are scaled way back. In this department, the game is a big downgrade even from the original. I know these are more presentation things, but with a shooter, the way weapons look and sound when they fire, and the reaction you get when you land shots on enemies, really does affect whether a game is satisfying to control. And in this case, there's a definite immersion-breaking disconnect that simply wasn't present before. Thankfully, the series' trademark variety still remains intact. The enemies may be stiff and lifeless, but boy, there sure are a lot of them. Along with the dinosaurs and mercenaries you've come to expect, Turok 3 introduces dogs and zombies straight from Resident Evil, these creepy crawling mutants, and even the fire dinosaurs from Turok 2 make an appearance. As for the game's arsenal, it carries over a lot of the best guns from previous iterations which is a great start, but it doesn't add anything super remarkable of its own. The only really notable addition is the Fire Swarm attachment for the shotgun, allowing you to burn the shit out of enemies from a distance. Can't really argue with that one. The bosses in Turok 3 are, once again, a bit of a mixed bag. I like that defeating them often involves more strategy than just strafing and shooting, but none are super memorable. This crab thing you fight in a submarine bay has to be the worst of them. Not because it's hard, but because how badly it tanks the frame rate. Honestly, the only one I really liked was the final fight. Not against Oblivion, but rather the possessed body of Joshua Fireseed. Mainly because it reminded me of a multiplayer deathmatch. Continuing along with unremarkable things, sound design, once again, is a big step back. Everything is fine, of course, but the weapon firing sounds and enemy wails don't quite hit the same as they did in previous titles. Same goes for the music, which is mostly generic throughout. I do appreciate some of the more tribal chanting that sometimes creeps in, and I like the soundscape around Oblivion's temple quite a bit for its ominous feel, but that's about it. And finally, it would be silly to talk about Turok 3 without mentioning the cutscenes. They're awkward and ugly, sure, but for the time, this level of lip sync is pretty crazy. I can't think of another game on Nintendo 64 where characters talked with so much expression. Unfortunately, it's still not overly convincing. So whatever time was spent mastering lip movement probably could have been better applied to improving animations during gameplay. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with Turok 3. It's a bit uneven and easily the weakest of the Nintendo 64 trilogy, but it does provide consistent fun and should, after its prolonged intro, scratch that Turok itch. So if you're like me and you've been putting this one off, give it a try. You're not missing out on some unsung masterpiece, but it's a solid game and definitely worth playing through once and 
Maybe twice, I guess. Joshua needs love too, after all. Be careful, little brother. I will. Turok Evolution was released in 2002 for the GameCube, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. It was advertised as a return to form for the series, not necessarily in terms of quality, but rather aesthetics. They want to make a game that looked and felt more like Turok Dinosaur Hunter, which is a great idea. Unfortunately, their ambition was somewhat compromised by the fact that the studio developing it, Acclaim, was going under. The end result is a little bit of a mess, and at the time, it did not review well. In Turok Evolution, you once again play as Tall Set, the hero of the original game. He's in the middle of a battle with Tobias Bruckner, a thoroughly racist Confederate soldier, when they're both pulled through a portal into the Lost Land. Tall Set is quickly enlisted by a sketchy wizard named Tarkeen to take up the mantle of Turok and thwart the evil Lord Tyrannus and his dinosaur army. Oh, and Bruckner finds a new gig as an evil general. You'll meet a lot of silly characters along the way, often awkwardly sliding into frame to tell Turok things of incredible importance. But none of it seems to matter that much or make any sense. What's important is the comedically dramatic writing and acting, coupled with some of the jankiest cutscenes you'll ever see. You and your unholy ilk will be cleansed. I will be all torn limb from limb. You, I know I smelled the stench of your dark magic in this. I have played no part in this, Tyrannus. Save that which my oath requires. You know the old ways as well as I. You will pay for your heresy with blood! Look, I love a good bad movie. They're a lot of fun. But very rarely can the same be said about a bad game. It takes a certain cocktail of genuine greatness and poor decision making to pull it off. And for my money, Turok Evolution is the best bad game ever made. And honestly, it's almost a crime to say that because it comes so close to greatness. It's all the little rough edges that hold it back. And if they were to be improved upon with, say, an HD remaster, things might be different. Anyway, for the purposes of this review, I'll be looking at the GameCube version. Personally, I prefer it on the Xbox thanks to its higher quality textures and more extensive wildlife, but it's a lot easier to capture GameCube footage, and really, it's mostly comparable. As long as you're on GameCube or Xbox, you're getting the full experience. The PlayStation 2 version, on the other hand, that's a little iffy. Turok Evolution, despite hearkening back to the original game's aesthetics, actually sticks closer to Turok 3 in terms of level design. Each of the game's chapters is broken into separate missions. And while you sometimes have to search for Tarkeen keys to open doors or pull the occasional lever, objectives are never very complicated, and usually everything you need can be found in the nearby area. Some fans may miss the heavier focus on exploration from Turok 1 and 2, but I really do think this is a better direction for the series. It puts the focus on what these games do best, I'm talking the varied locations, monsters, and the absolute finest arsenal in gaming. And hey, judged strictly on these merits, Turok Evolution is very much worthy of the mantle set by its predecessors. Throughout the campaign, you'll travel through jungles teeming with raptors, caves with saber-toothed tigers, ancient ruins, a flying city that looks a lot like New Mombasa from Halo 2, and a whole slew of heavily fortified slag outposts. Those are the dinosaur guys, by the way. And with this game, you really do get your money's worth, 
The chapter seemed to go on and on, almost to the point of tedium. If you were to play straight through the campaign in one sitting, you might start to feel a bit of fatigue. Turok Evolution is very much the kind of game that works better in short bursts, where you progress a little farther each time. It's not that it's repetitive, it's just that the constant action might wear on you after a while. And there's definitely some inconsistency with the way things are paced out. Some missions can be done in like 5 minutes, while others might take over an hour. I like that you never quite know when a level's gonna end, but this decision definitely butts heads with the very stingy checkpoint system. And by that, I mean, there are no checkpoints. It doesn't matter if you've been chipping away at a tricky level for 40 minutes and you're almost done. If you die, you start over. It doesn't help that the developers like to place the nastiest enemies and most unexpected traps right near the end. This mountain mission in Chapter 3 is probably the first time you'll experience this problem for yourself. It takes forever to climb the winding paths, avoiding dropships and snipers. And then, right at the top, you hear this weird popcorn sound effect, and then rocks fall on your head, probably killing you instantly. Bull. Shit. So yeah, if someone wanted to fix this game, adding checkpoints midway through the biggest levels should be the first item on their list. Anyway, as long as you can tolerate replaying the same level a few too many times, you'll hopefully be able to appreciate the way developers find new and interesting ways to stage combat encounters. There might be stealth segments, or areas with tons of verticality. You might tear through war-torn streets with a platoon of NPC allies, shoot down hot air balloons with a mounted turret, or just go guns a-blazing through hallways, mowing down support beams and crushing enemy forces along the way. Almost every level seems to add some new wrinkle, and combined with the frenetic moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, Turok Evolution plays shockingly well. I won't go as far as to compare it to Halo or some of the best shooters from the time, but aside from wonky ladder climbing and whatever the hell this is, Turok controls well enough. But that's just one factor at play here. The other thing that really helps bring the package together is the game's insanely fun enemy AI. The various slag units and creatures you encounter aren't exactly smart, but their scripting does sometimes create that illusion. The slags seem to split up and flank pretty dynamically and often know the best moment to push an advantage. But not always. Sometimes they just stand around like morons, or worse, run in circles. I don't know, I kinda like that the game manages to work at both ends of the spectrum. This way, if a fight isn't fun, you can almost guarantee it'll at least be funny. Seriously, these slag guys are total clowns. The other key ingredient here, as you might have guessed, is the arsenal, which I'm confident is the best in the series. All of the reliable standbys are here, like the tech bow, the pistol, the shotgun, and the rocket launcher. But you also have fun new weapons. The flechette gun fires silenced darts, absolutely tearing through appendages and brains. Poison arrows bring enemies to their knees and make them vomit their guts out. And the plasma rifle rounds both track targets and explode. In fact, every gun has multiple firing modes, essentially doubling your arsenal. The aforementioned flechette gun for example, can convert into a minigun, no idea why. The rocket launcher can fire, well, rockets, or if you prefer, you can unleash these things called swarm bores, which are similar to the cerebral bore from Turok 2 and 3. Oh yeah, and it can also convert into a nuke, so that's cool. Even the game's less exciting guns get a facelift thanks to the addition of alternate firing modes. The shotgun in particular is really great. It can fire a single blast, like you would expect, or you can chamber multiple shots at a time and fire them all at once in a single glorious explosion of lead. Oh, and I gotta give a special mention to the starting melee weapon, the axe. It remains an effective option for close encounters all the way to the final fight, and by holding the fire button, Truck can charge it up and really bring the pain. 
Combined with the excellent sound design of both the weapons themselves and the enemy's hilarious screams of agony, plus the absolutely excessive levels of gore, you'll quickly find yourself embracing the utter absurd mayhem of it all. Another area where Turok Evolution may falter a bit is in the graphics department. I've already discussed the bizarre cutscenes, but everything in the game is equally unpolished. It's a weird hybrid of stuff that actually looks nice, like certain dinosaur models and atmospheric vistas, and drab, ugly textures, weird lighting, and blocky, poorly animated NPCs. Some areas look absolutely vibrant, teeming with all manner of flora and fauna, while others seem, frankly, unfinished. This sentiment holds true for the bosses, of which there are a grand total of two. First is this Styracosaurus armed with cannons that you fight in a giant arena, and the other is Bruckner, riding atop a tusked, fire-breathing Tyrannosaurus. They're both fun, but thoroughly forgettable. The only strategy you need to win is to strafe in circles and keep shooting. Or, in Bruckner's case, you can totally cheese him by hiding in the downed dropship and axing the T-Rex's lower jaw as it clips through the wall. The other big negative here, alongside the lack of checkpoints, is the inclusion of pterodactyl dogfighting. It's a bit like Star Fox, but way jankier. Some sections are on rails and others are more open, allowing you to turn around and approach targets from multiple angles. Everything controls well enough, and on paper this sounds like a fun expansion of Turok 2's brief Styracosaurus segment. But there are two key things that hamper these missions. First is the design of the levels themselves. The difficulty spikes are wildly unbalanced and often totally unfair. Sometimes the enemy flyers can't hit anything, but then other times, they're ace pilots who could put the Red Baron to shame. Oh, and we have to address the elephant in the room. The pterodactyl can take a lot of abuse, but man does it hate walls. Sometimes you'll just get hurt a bit and bounce off, which is probably what should always happen, but usually you just explode. And once again, some of the craziest, most difficult to maneuver passages often come right at the end of a level. So, for any future developers seeking to remaster this game, take a look at how Star Fox 64 handles wall collisions, and just do that. The last thing I should touch on is the music. Look, this isn't my strong suit. Give me something loud and bombastic, or maybe a little electronic, and I'll hum it until the day I die. Turok Evolution isn't that. It alternates between subdued and atmospheric, and triumphant orchestral. It all sounds good and often quite fitting, but there aren't any real earworms here. I guess the best I can say is that it's never bad or distracting, even if it rarely adds too much to the experience. At the end of the day, I don't really expect to convert anyone to the cult of Turok evolution, but I do hope that some of my impassioned ranting has at least somewhat illustrated why somebody might view this game as an unsung, almost masterpiece. Your ability to enjoy it will absolutely come down to tolerance. The good stuff is there, as long as you don't mind subjecting yourself to some truly frustrating flaws. And if you can appreciate the charm of a goofy AI encounter, or absolutely absurd displays of carnage, that's a bonus too. Unfortunately, Evolution was the only Turok game released for this console generation, and while I would have liked 7 or 8 more of them, I'm very happy with what we got. And that just goes to show, there's an audience for every game, even the sloppy ones.
Following the poor reception of Turok Evolution and the closing of Acclaim Studios, things were looking mighty bleak for this once great franchise. All that changed, however, in 2008, when Propaganda Games and Disney, yes, that Disney, decide to dust off the Son of Stone and give him a grand reintroduction. Bring it. Considering it's now 2023 and we still haven't seen a sequel, you can probably guess how well that went. Turok, as the name suggests, is an attempt to wipe the slate clean. It is in no way connected to past iterations and doesn't really adhere to much of its source. Turok is no longer a mantle, it's a guy's name, and the lost land is just a random planet that's being terraformed. From a narrative perspective, the dinosaurs and the tech bow are the only true carryovers. But hey, as much as I love this series, I can't imagine too many people remember the Campaigner, the Primogen, Tarkeen, Bruckner, or even the plot of any previous game. So, at least as far as I'm concerned, a reimagining is fine as long as the gameplay is good. Oh, and it's gotta have dinosaurs. Can't make a Turok without those. Also, it really should be noted that the story here isn't bad. It's just generic. So you see, Joseph Turok used to work for this bad dude named Kane, but after suffering a crisis of conscience, he's joined forces with the Colonial Marines. Er, I mean, Whiskey Company. It turns out Kane is up to no good, and Turok is Whiskey Company's best chance at tracking him down. Naturally, his new Gears of War-esque comrades don't trust him. But as the game develops, what do you know, he becomes a key part of the team. To be perfectly honest, I actually find the character of Slade, voiced by Ron Perlman, to be rather endearing. When looking at the whole group, he's the most distrustful and bitter toward Turok at the beginning. And as predictable as the outcome is, their eventual friendship, however muted, feels well earned. Aside from being generic, the other big issue is the quality of the writing itself. All too often, Turok is sent on a mission with a small team, and on multiple occasions he returns alone. The way I see it, you get one of those. If you repeat a plot beat too many times, it just becomes a joke. So when this asshole character accuses him of being a double agent, it's really not that unreasonable of a conclusion to draw. And hey, a better writer might have used this thread to explore moral gray areas or build tension. Instead, he makes the accusation and then he's gunned down like two seconds later. Problem solved, I guess. Continuing with the trend set by Turok 3 and then later refined in Turok Evolution, this installment is as linear as shooters get. Levels feature narrow sections that push you forward, and larger, more open areas for bigger conflicts. Checkpoints are generally quite generous, although there are a few exceptions. As a result, these are the only times when the game flaunts with frustration. Otherwise, it's a perfectly enjoyable, turn off your brain and make enemies go boom kind of game. There are certainly memorable set pieces strung throughout, including a few fun shootouts where you work with the entirety of Whiskey Company, this neat boss in the cave level, and of course the various Tyrannosaurus Rex encounters. But for the most part, large stretches of the game are harmlessly forgettable. As was the case with the plot, most of the gameplay conventions you associate with the Turok franchise are either massively stripped down or removed altogether. Instead of collecting life force tokens, keys, or assembling a ridiculous arsenal of guns, Turok 2008 is content to just adopt every vanilla feature standard to modern shooters. Turok can only hold two guns at a time, some of which can be dual wielded and mixed and matched, and he's got recharging health. This is something that makes sense in a game like Halo, where you're wearing power armor, and I know Turok isn't the first human in gaming to gain this ability, but it still seems ridiculous. The guy can take a chain gun to the face, and as long as he hides behind a rock for 10 seconds, he's good to go. The only thing that makes him seem human at all is the way your screen shakes and blurs when you take damage. 
This is a reasonable visualization of having your body riddled with bullets, but of course, from the perspective of the player, it's a little annoying. As someone with very poor eyesight, the damage effect in Turok is very close to what I see when I take off my glasses, albeit with a bit more red. And that screen shake? Oh gosh. I do like how it makes it harder to aim when you're under fire, giving combat a more frantic and desperate feeling, but if you're prone to motion sickness, Turok is not going to be a fun experience. In terms of enemies, this game is pretty solid. The dinosaurs are obvious standouts, and this might be the first game in the series to employ them consistently throughout its entire campaign. Design-wise, they air closer to movie monsters than realistic depictions, but the way they move is very fluid and convincing. And I really appreciate the way blood covers their bodies as they take damage. Despite Disney's involvement, it's nice to see that Turok can still deliver on the gore. The variety of species you encounter also seems acceptable, with a few different types of raptors, various smaller dinosaurs, and herbivores, a derpy looking Dilophosaurus, these crazy, probably made up tree monsters, and of course the T-Rex, which never fails to leave an impression. Seriously, this thing is big, and while most of its encounters are very scripted, I can guarantee it'll boost your heart rate every time. Along with dinosaurs, you'll also fight some overgrown bugs, which provide a nice bit of late game variety, and of course Kane's mercenaries. Unfortunately, these dudes are a bit of a downgrade from the slags and dinosoids of Turok's past. I mean, just look at them. They're basically rent-a-cop soldiers. You've shot at these same guys in every first-person shooter ever made. And sure, they're perfectly fine to fight, but there's nothing remarkable here. The only possible exception is the heavily processed screams they make from behind their face masks. It's not like some mind-blowing thing, I just find it satisfying. And to be fair, the mercenaries, as generic as they are, do get elevated when they get into fights with the bugs or the dinosaurs. These kind of enemy-on-enemy -enemy interactions are a little too rare, but they're always fun, especially when there's a T-Rex involved. In terms of weaponry, Turok settles in a weird place between ambitious and mundane. The arsenal here is a lot smaller than past entries, and far more generic. Hey, there's that word again. The shotgun, pistol, and SMG feel like they've been ripped straight from a Call of Duty game, and have no real personality of their own. They're all fun to fire, and it's neat that most of the weapons remain relevant all the way to the final fight, but there's nothing wacky or over the top. This is a very grounded offering that's entertaining, but never super creative. The only weapons that really stand out are the tech bow, retaining the simple pleasure of exploding arrows, this remote sticky detonator, which would later be copied into Halo 4, and the chain gun. Not just because chain guns are inherently fun, but because Turok can set it up as an automated sentry turret, fight through a room, and then move it to a new location. Sometimes the game even offers the opportunity to juggle multiple chain guns at once, such as this section with flying insects. And I have to say, it's kinda brilliant. Too bad the game never really goes all in on a tower defense segment. Where are the energy totems when you need them? Anyway, before moving on, there's one other weapon that really needs highlighting, and that's the knife. Yes, the knife. I don't know what the intention was here, but somebody messed up bad. You see, if you stand anywhere close to an enemy, Turok can perform a third-person takedown. The animations are cool as hell, and this makes sense as a stealth tactic, but you can knife any enemy at any time, even if they're trying to eat you. And for some crazy reason, the animation gives Turok a prolonged period of invincibility. This is one of those rare situations where a weapon is so overpowered that you actually have to handicap yourself to enjoy the other parts of the game. I really like shooting at dinosaurs. Their rapid movements make for extremely fun targets, and their varied shapes help break up the monotony of aiming for mercenaries' heads. But when you can just knife them, one after another, with no consequence, why would you bother wasting the ammo? 
Seriously, look how ridiculous this is. And while it's entertaining for a bit, watching the same three or four animations back to back to back gets old fast. In terms of presentation, Turok 2008 is a very solid experience. Sound design is fantastic across the board, and the music is mostly in line with what you should expect from the series, with drums and more epic swells, which are never unwelcome but rarely rise into something truly memorable. Graphically, it holds up pretty well. The environments are a bit dull, alternating between uninspired futuristic military bunkers and generic jungles, but being the newest Turok game, it's easily the best looking of the bunch. And as I mentioned before, the dinosaurs look really good. And honestly, they might still be the gold standard. Overall, Turok 2008 is an enjoyable game that really should have led to something bigger. Considering how minor its issues are, the only real explanation I can come up with for its commercial failure is the lack of ambition. A lot of this game plays it safe, favoring tried and true genre staples over embracing the wackiness and over-the-top carnage of its predecessors. Turok 2008 does occasionally ramp up and tease a return to the series' former highs, but for the most part it seems content to be a average sci-fi military shooter. And if that's the worst thing you could say about a game, I guess that's pretty good. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey through the Summer of Stone. Turok 2008 was the last mainline game released as of this recording, but hey, don't worry, there's still plenty more Turok to talk about. Yeah. So if you enjoyed this content, let me know down below and maybe next summer we can do it all again. Okay? Okay. <laughs>